first, just a little thing about exercise five. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say about exercise five, so I'll just give you the brief rundown on what, what it is. Uh, for exercise five, you're going to start using the elevator hardware, uh, either actually the hardware or the simulator. Actually, you're going to use both, because eventually you're going to need both. Uh, you'll need the hardware elevator when demonstrating on the lab, obviously. And when working from home, it's very convenient to have a simulator, because that lets you work with multiple elevators on the same machine at the same time. So that's just convenient. That's nice to have. So the exercise is split into two parts. The first part is uh, use one of the drivers for the elevator hardware, and then use the same driver, but for the simulator, because the driver is the same for both of these two, because that's the way we've set it up. Uh, and then the part two of that exercise is actually implement a state machine that controls the elevator. So that would be the relevant part of the TDK4235 projects that most of you have already taken. Who here has not taken that project? Not taken TDK4235. Okay. So the project there was control an elevator, implement an elevator algorithm. So if there are requests at a floor, make it move up and down to service all of these requests. And the, the correct way to do this was use a state machine to implement this. So that stuff is documented in the um, project resources repository, which I've linked to in the exercise five repository. So this should be uh, within the scope of what you are able to do. Well, not necessarily in four hours, but this is, this is where the project starts for real. This is where you'll actually start working with the project, your own project repository, and start programming the project. So hopefully that all works out great. I, I think it's a good place to start as well, because now you're starting to interface with the hardware. You start seeing things moving, and that's motivating. Um, so I don't have much more to say about exercise five. Oh, yeah, uh, last thing. Approval for that one is also part of the project delivery. So if you deliver the project, you'll get it approved. If you, for some reason, don't want to deliver the project, then you'll have to get approval separately. <coughs> but I don't think that applies to anyone. Hopefully not. OK. Uh, today, oh yeah, uh, TCP jokes. Does mouse work, by the way? Yes, uh, TCP jokes. Um, I also have a UDP joke, but you might not get it. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. So, um, but I'm going to continue the stuff on distributed systems that I started last time. And I didn't do a super great job about it, so I'm going to do it more properly this time. Uh, but first, before we talk about distributing systems, let's talk about a non-distributed system. So let's just talk about the general the process that you are running, not just the executable, but how do you organize, or how do you create a program. So this is the thing I drew up last time. I'm just going to draw it up on the blackboard that is currently consumed by what looks like some kind of momentum about, OK, whatever. Some kind of physics, but it might actually be chemistry. So first off, I'm just going to make a bunch of observations about this, um, this generalized process structure, because it doesn't look like much, but it actually contains a whole lot of information. So, uh, I don't have space on the slide to have everything, so I'm just going to draw it up here. OK. So first, let's make some observations about what, what this, the internal structure of this, because I need to justify why this thing is a thing that I like, why it exists. And I'm going to be using it not just today, but also next week and probably the week after that again as well. So this is kind of a fundamental structure. Uh, the nice thing about this is that, well, 
This is completely generalized. This is just what a computer does. It has some output. It calculates the output based on the input values you give to the program and some internal state mechanisms. And then it also calculates the next state based on the previous state and the inputs. So this is, this is super general. So let's look at the, uh, some observations we can make about this. Uh, there are two flows here, which I covered briefly last time. The first flow is the control flow, which is who decides when to do what. So you can either have the control flow, you need the output, so in order to get an output, you need to figure out what the state is, and you need to figure out what the inputs were. So this is a polling model. So this, this means the control flow kind of goes downward. And you can also do it the other way around, where the control flow goes upward, which is a more message-passing, event-based system, where you, have, you don't think of it as we are actively reading the hardware to get the input. It's the hardware is telling us that it got the input, which is a different way of thinking and makes more sense in a message passing kind of system. Get out of here, chemistry or physics. OK. Then we have this feedback loop here. This is what lets a generalized process capture time-varying stuff. So if something varies in time, it needs to be, or well, we need to store it. It needs to have some kind of concept of nextness and previous next, previousness. And this is encapsulated. This is captured here in this state feedback loop. Uh, and also, if we have discrete time event inputs, then we have a discrete time system here. It's like, well, you can think of this as a continuous time system or a discrete time system. A discrete time system makes more sense, because especially if you can log the inputs. Like, this happened at that time, instead of we are continuously reading the inputs. So effectively, what we have here is a generalized state machine. It's not just a finite state machine, but it could also be an infinite state machine or, well, continuous counter or anything like that. Then if we draw a bigger circle around the entire process. And we call this the process. And then the output filters outwards. And we get a bunch of inputs from the outside world. We see that the state box here, the process has exclusive ownership of the state. You cannot transform the state from the outside. There are no arrows that go directly to the state here. This is not a global variable that you can write to. In order to write to this variable, it first needs to go through this filtering process and this function transformation process, and then you can write to the state. So you're not directly manipulating state. This thing does not exist, which is super convenient. So this is basically no, no public variables, no globally shared variables, and so on. And also, if we add some kind of filtering mechanisms of some kind, then we can accept or reject transformations. And then the other cool thing, which we're going to cover more next time when I'm going to talk about testability of software, why, why structuring this not just as a distributed system, but as a local, uh, distributing your program across a bunch of, say, Go routines or Erlang processes or whatever, is a good structure for any program. Um, I'm going to talk about testability. And one of the things that's cool about this is that these functions here, this function one and function two, can be pure functions, which means that these functions have no side effects. These functions don't affect the outside world in any way. So these functions that to transform state and generate output don't actually have an impact on the outside world. Of course, creating a list of outputs that will be applied in this stage like create a function that returns a function that will be applied is not super convenient to write in most programming languages, but um, conceptually you can do this. So for the, uh, the 4235 project, you could return, instead of actually turning off the light, you could return an off button light function. And then you go through the list of all the functions that you need to apply to the outside world, and then you apply them. And also, just generally, pure functions, functions that only have inputs and outputs and don't modify anything, are really easy to test. 
We're going to cover that next week. Then let's do some observations about connections. Because generally speaking, we would have processes. So we have another one of these. Uh, we have another one of these processes, and then the outputs of one is the input of the other one. Okay, these cross these lines cross now, but deal with it. So the main point here is that well, these let's look at these lines when we connect these lines together. So we can either do this lo locally by having multiple threads in one program, or I guess also multiple objects in one program if we're doing object-oriented stuff. Um, but these can also be distributed. And the difference between locally and distributed, not technically, but pragmatically, is that the difference is that locally you don't lose any messages. These messages are guaranteed to arrive as long as the local process doesn't die. But in a distributed sense, these processes are these messages are not guaranteed to arrive, so there's uh, some amount of dottedness to this line because there's no, we don't have any network guarantees here. The other thing is that we're not sending the state because the state is locally owned here, or not just locally owned, but uniquely owned here. We cannot access the state directly, and we also cannot send the state outwards directly. So in order to send the state, we need to transform it to a copy before we send it. So we don't send pointers to memory addresses here. We send copies of values uh, out of there. Of course, in shitty programming languages like Go, you can actually send pointers because it doesn't stop you from doing stupid list, stuff like that. But in more sensible places like Rust and also D, you just can't do that. It just won't let you do that because it's stupid. Why did I write that? Oh yeah, if you send copies of data, you don't send the data itself, then you don't have this multiple processes trying to write the same data. This is what lets us get this unique ownership concept. And then we also have multiple inputs. So we can have one process accessing only one input, and then another process accessing only the other input. So if the process on the right-hand side here has access to one input, it doesn't necessarily have access to all the inputs. So it's not like I have a reference to the entire process. I just have a reference to one of the inputs to the process, which is the a big difference between a message passing system like CSP, like stuff with channels, like in Go, and an actor model system like in Erlang. Because if you have access to the actor, the process, well, you have access to all the inputs. But if you have access to a channel, well, you only have access to the channel, one of the inputs. And then finally, sending and receiving is destructive, particularly sending. Receiving destructive, well, you can log a replay buffer of what you've received and then replay the stuff that you've received or something. But at least once you've, something has ex within this system, you can have as much rollback and feedback and backtracking and restarting as you just as you want but the moment any copy of value goes out of this boundary you can't unsend a message so what is sent is sent and then in a distributed sent sense what is sent but not received is still sent and that's kind of important because if you send something the only thing you know is that you sent it you don't know anything about if it has arrived or not. And you can't unsend it in case you're trying to send from two, two things or trying to send to one thing. One of these arrives and the other one does not arrive. You can't unsend the one that did arrive. It's already done. So this poses a bit of a challenge. OK, so let's conclude some things that we've figured out here. The process, well, imagine a process that doesn't have state. What is a process that doesn't have state? Well, it's just, it's just a filter that transforms inputs directly into outputs. That's not super useful because it 
doesn't, then there is no justification for having it as a process. It could just live in somebody else's process. It's not unique. In order for a process to be uniquely useful, it needs to have state. Okay. In order for there to be a use for sending a message, it must have an effect. Sending a message that has no effect on the inputs or the state transformation of the process does not seem useful. So in order for a message to be useful, it must carry information that would invoke some kind of state transformation in the receiving process. So conclusion here for now is that statefulness is usefulness. Without stateful transformations, there is no point in the program. It doesn't need to exist. So let's combine these two, because something very interesting happens now. If we lose a message, that means that we are losing potential state transformation in the receiving end. If we reorder messages, we are potentially reordering the state transformations in the receiving process. So this is like taking all of your locally stored data and just scrambling it randomly. And usually programs don't like it when their internal state is scrambled randomly. So there's an interesting duality here that, and this is, I need to make sure I formulate this properly so you really understand how important this is. If you lose, if you lose messages in a system where messages and processes are implemented in such a way that they are actually useful, well, you're fucked. There's a duality here. The process cannot live without the messages that connect these, them together, and the messages serve no process purpose unless they connect processes. So you need both of these things. And it's, like, it's fairly obvious that a message passing system doesn't work unless you pass the messages and there is nothing that you pass the messages between. It makes sense, but it's important to understand that you need both of these things. Uh, the unfortunate conclusion then is that well, the problem with distributed systems was losing messages because we don't have any guarantees about messages arriving. So if there's no guarantee about messages arriving, there's no guarantee about the processes transforming their states in a sensible way. So we have a state machine that just kind of doesn't do what it's supposed to do. That's not very nice. So we need a general purpose abstraction that captures all possible ways we can lose and reorder and duplicate messages over a, an arbitrary network. Yeah, good luck, buddy. So, which means that there is no, there's no convenient general purpose abstra abstraction for a distributed system. There is no way you can just import distributed system.h or whatever. There, that doesn't exist. Does anyone want to argue with this conclusion? Or does this seem reasonable? Hopefully I've justified this then. Well, okay, there, there is, there is a, uh, a loophole. Uh, and we're gonna explore that. But first we need to talk about time. Yeah, I'll use this part, okay. So we had uh, the, the different ways that we could mess up the communication aspect of the network. So, did I have them here? Yeah, okay, I had them here. So these were the three ways we could mess up our network. So I'm just gonna, this figure isn't important, I'm just gonna draw it up anyway. So we had loss, uh, duplicates, and then reorder. And I'm gonna put them in a box because I like boxes. Okay. These are kind of on the same level of badness. These are just generally speaking different manifestations of a problem that occurs uh, commonly among all of these. And the problem that occurs commonly among all of these is uh, progression of time is not constant. Uh, 
that typing. So we can start drawing like a big triangular stuff where the highest possible concept in this hierarchy is that the progression of time is not constant and then we have different manifestations of non-constant time occurring as lower parts of the hierarchy and then you can look at particular kinds of losses losing important messages versus unimportant messages that's down here somewhere and different degrees of duplications and different kinds of reordering because reordering two messages and reordering four messages are different kinds of severities and that goes underneath there and this is implementation detail. But at the highest point in this hierarchy of time, time related problems, the problem is generally speaking that time doesn't progress at the rate of one second per second. Okay, cool. So we had a problem with time management in the message passing uh, domain. So, if we have a problem with time in the message passing domain, and we have the duality of state transformations in a process and state transmission in the messages, we need both of these things. Well, what happens if we either allow for or unreorder time in the process? It's a big brain moment. So, time doesn't work in the messages. What makes, let's see if we can unmake the wrong time internally in the process or allow for wrong time internally in the process. Who oh boy. So let's see if we can use this. Solutions to non constant Well, um, if we assume that there are messages that are being sent and these messages have some sequence number, so each message is numbered, and then on the receiving end of the process, so over here in this filter box here, or uh, rather in this, well, it depends. You need to know what the previous message was. If the previous message was the one directly before, we accept the new message. If it was not the one directly before, we discard the new message. So we only allow the process to increment in perfect lockstep. Okay, seems reasonable. If all processes are perfectly synchronized because they're all progressing in lockstep because the messages are numbered, great system. There's only one slight problem here. Um, this is the impossible general purpose abstraction that the holy grail that we wanted. And the reason why this doesn't work is that if, if we have two processes that are trying to count in lockstep, one of, one of is, is following and the one is master. And the master one counts one, two, three, four. And it just sends one message each time. It counts, sends the one, okay, I'm ready, it's a one. Sends the two, it doesn't arrive, it sends the three. Three doesn't progress directly after one. Now this one is stuck if eternally on one while the master keeps counting upwards. So, okay, well let's try sending the duplicates all the time. Well what happens if not enough of these duplicates happen? Or we, we retry often enough to overcome the loss, but we don't retry often, often enough. It's eventually, you're going to reach a situation where sending 10 duplicates and all 10 of them disappear. So duplicates aren't, uh, it's not enough. Okay, well, let's try something else. Let's try discarding non-monotonic uh, updates. So we're only counting upwards, but we can skip some. So we can count, the master counts one, two, three, four, five. But the slave reflecting can count 1, 2, 4, 18, 19, 20. And they can just skip over values. And this is often viable. For example, uh, in most video games, you have a client server type model, and the server, the client needs to know what the server thinks that everybody, the position of all the players. The server has the correct position of all the players, and the clients need to know the latest version. You don't really care about where the players were five seconds ago. You were care about where they were as short a possible time ago. So 20 milliseconds, preferably, or possibly even less. So in this case, you only care about the latest updates. You don't care about all the previous updates. So that kind of system, this works fine. You just add a counter. This is the state at the nth time interval, and then you use the latest version. And you can also do this in the elevator project. That works fine.
but sometimes uh, you need to have, well, you have a, the problem if you do constant upward counting is that you may end up with a state machine here that has an infinite number of states because it needs to keep, it needs to be able to keep counting upwards. And that gives you an infinite number of states, potentially, if you program it a bit poorly. So you see, like, well, we can make some optimizations here. We can say that we're not counting upwards. We're only counting upwards to 10, and then we wrap around back and start at 0 again. So you have some amount of controlled amounts of resetting, where you count upwards generally, but sometimes you reset, or sometimes you count downwards. And you accept a few messages that are out of sync, because it's convenient and it's useful. And this is absolutely possible, but you need to start being careful. Because eventually you're like, well, what happens if this message is out of order? Not just the one we want to be out of order, but this one that we didn't want to be out of order, and it starts getting a bit hairy. And then, uh, well, the easiest thing is just say, fuck it, and whatever messages arrive, they arrive, and what messages don't arrive, they don't arrive, and we just accept all possible amounts of inconsistencies, and we just don't care about the problem at all. And that's uh, usually not viable, because again, if you input, if the inputs happen in an order which you don't accept or expect, then usually you'll get an order of state transformations that produce a set of outputs that are not what you accept or expect. So that's usually not, usually not fine. But sometimes it is which is interesting. Sometimes you can accept that the system behaves in an inconsistent way. So, well, we have another kind of hierarchy here. We have traded one thing for another thing. So at the top here, we have the most, the highest possible amount of consistency. We want all of our nodes to be in perfect agreement about some amount of state. And at the bottom, we have the least amount of consistency, which is we I'll don't even care about them agreeing on the same state. And then in the middle, we have some varying amounts of agreement. So some varying amount of consistency and some varying amount of inconsistency. So there's a trade-off here. Well, also, at the top, we have something that's impossible. Just, it's just actually not possible. And at the bottom, we have something that's not particularly useful. So in order to have something useful, we tend, well, we have to be somewhere in the middle, which is inconvenient, because that means that we ha don't have absolute rules that we can follow that lets us generate a perfect, we don't have absolute rules that lets us implement a general purpose distributed systems, which means we have a lot of application dependent stuff going on. So what's the trade-off? Well, at the top of the hierarchy, we had maximum <coughs> consistency. And at the bottom of the hierarchy, we had maximum chaos. But the chaos, we could get away with doing nothing, and we got chaos. So there's consistency at the cost of protocol. We need to manage what kinds of messages we accept and don't accept. Also, I don't know who here has heard about the cap theorem? Nobody. OK, well, TLDR. It's been mathematically proven that for a distributed system, or any system for that matter, you can have at most two of the three properties of consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. This is just a mathematical fact that you can't escape from. So consistency means that all of your replicas have the same data, or agree on the same data. Availability means that they actually respond to you when you ask them for what the data is. And then partition tolerance is that you have multiple sets of multiple, you have two disconnected groups that must be rejoined back together again, so that they end up with a, a, some kind of consensus about what the correct state is. And while there, it's been formally proved, but informally, I guess it also makes intuitive sense that, okay, in order for everybody to agree on something and for me to be able to see what that value is, 
there needs to be only one of them. So it needs to be unique, which means that it's not partitioned. Okay, makes sense. In order for me to be able to get some value out of it from one of many partitions, well, if they're partitioned, they can't agree on what that thing they respond with is, which means that it must be not consistent. Okay, well, let's do the last one. Uh, which one is the last one? Well, consistent and partition tolerant. Okay, so it's in order for something to, it will give me the same result. I have it partitioned, so there are two separate ones, and I can must be able to ask each one of them. In order for it to be able to give me an answer, well, since it's partitioned, it doesn't know, one partition doesn't know about the other partition, so it can't agree on it, so it must either give me something that is, there's an inconsistency, or it must say, no, I can't give you a value right now because I am partitioned and therefore it's impossible for me to give you the correct answer. So, thereby, informally proved, uh, you can only have one, two of these three at the same time. You cannot have all three at the same time. So there's also that trade-off. If you want absolute consistency, you must either refuse to reply because you don't know about the consistency, or you must reply and just say that, well, this is the best I've got, but I don't know if it's universally true for all partitions. It's just true for me right now. So that's the other trade-off. But the trade-off I want to focus on right now is not the formal logic one. It's the the amount of code you need to write in order to provide a, or make a distributed system that is consistent or delivers outputs that are, well, deliver outputs that make sure that Svata doesn't starve when he pushes the button, basically. So we need to manage what kind of messages we are willing to accept, what kind of messages we're willing to reject, we need to manage the disorder in time of these messages because these messages can arrive in any order and in any amount. So we need to implement, we internally in this process, we need to manage which messages we accept or reject and what we do with them. So the protocol that we need to write in order to manage, manage this mess of unreliable messages needs to be run on the reliable part, which is our process. And then the responsibility for making sure that these messages are, the disorderly timed messages are handled appropriately is now a responsibility that is potentially shared among both the receiver and the sender. So it's not just enough to write the protocol on one node, you usually have to write the protocol on multiple or all of the nodes in order to make this guarantee. Of course, writing protocol, while well, you're writing code, duh, Writing code limits what your state or your stateful process can do. So we're imposing limitations on what we accept and what we're, well, if we're rejecting something, we're imposing limitations on what we accept. So protocol is, in general purpose, its limitation. In order to get a limitation, we need to also have the specialization, which usually means that this state feedback loop gets more specialized, it gets more states, and oh boy, here we go. So the process that originally was designed to do something very simple, which was just accept the new order from other elevator. Okay, got new order. That thing now gets more states and is not just okay, accept new order. There's more states, it's accept potentially unconfirmed order that only I know about, and then it's accept confirmed order that everybody knows about, and now we have two states, and it gets, it gets weird. So let's look at these protocols. Is time flying? 1457? Well, this is the last section, so I think we're just going to keep going. So let's first just look at what consistency means. Uh, the, just like the definitions of the words. So in distributed systems, consistency usually just means that the replicas agree. Like the state in one node is the same as the state in the other node. Therefore, thereby they are consistent. They agree with each other. 
And in formal logic, it means that, well, it's, the system is free from contradiction. So if one replica says one thing and the other replica says some other thing, well, they contradict each other. So these are the same thing. So let's see if we can, well, let's start with the least amount of protocol that we need to apply which is we allow inconsistency. In other words, we al allow contradiction in the system. Sounds scary. If you have an elevator system that contradicts itself, uh, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens. Uh, because what often happens is that you don't really care about having a perfectly consistent system. You really, what you really care about is having a system that has desirable outputs. So sometimes there are inconsistencies in the system that are OK. For example, these inconsistencies. Some of these inconsistencies are OK, and some of these are not OK. So if two elevators arrive, that's not a, well, we asked for one elevator, but we got two. That's not consistent. But it's an, and it bubbles up to the user observable space where I can see that two elevators arrived. Is that OK? Yeah, well, it's more OK than no elevator arriving, but it's not a consistent, well, it's not some amount of contradiction happened within our system to provoke this kind of behavior. And also for the lights, what happens if a light turns on but no elevator arrives? Oh, that, oh boy, that sounds bad. What happens if an elevator arrives but the light in the button didn't turn on? Well, it's much better. It's not perfect, but it's much better. So we can allow, we can allow for this kind of inconsistency. We don't need a perfect system, we just need it to satisfy the requirements. So in this case, we just need to look very carefully at the requirements, which means that, of course, uh, looking very carefully at requirements makes it hard to reason about because now we need to look very carefully instead of just following some procedure. Uh, and the other part is that if we're going to allow some inconsistencies, we need to be very careful about which inconsistencies we allow. And in order to allow inconsistencies, it means that there are certain amount, certain kinds of messages, message reorderings and duplication paths and whatever. This permutation space um, well, we need to consider all the possible combinations here to figure out which ones lead to the desired inconsistencies and which ones lead to the undesired inconsistencies and then apply some amount of protocol to figure out which ones is which. So this gets really hard really quickly. Uh, and also, yeah, uh, we just don't just need to consider lost messages, we also need to consider lost nodes. And that adds, well, it's, it's a common, <laughs> combinatorial explosion. Suddenly, we have all the permutations of possible message reorderings and all the possible permutations of node loss reorderings. Yeah, yikes, usually. So this is, this is not cool. So let's see if we can collapse this space of possible time-dependent ordering problems. Let's see if we can collapse this into a smaller space and apply some amount of methodical approach here. Well, we don't really care about what's going on inside here. We don't really care about the internals of the protocol. What we care about is the user observable outputs. So we have a couple of, um, a couple of methods that we apply. If we can accept that the messages are reordered in an arbitrary way, so we receive message 1, 2, 3, or 1, 3, 2, or 3, 1, 2, and it doesn't matter what order they arrive in, like we're trying to add three numbers together, it doesn't matter what order we add them together in, as long as we receive all of them. So this is the mathematical property known as being commutative, which you are all hopefully familiar with. So if we can make sure that the receiver is commutative, so it doesn't care about the orders of messages, cool. Usually we can't because, well, if we don't care about the order, it's like saying we don't care about the order in which the states were transformed in our process. And that's like saying we have a state machine that can go to any state at any time. Eh. So you usually know. And then loss, well, we can handle loss pretty easily and just have the sender retry often enough to overcome loss. It's not a perfect system, but it works. 
And then if we overcome loss by sending duplicates, well, we need to be able to handle duplicates. And that's the second mathematical property known as being idempotent. Who here has heard about idempotent before? Nobody. It's not a very well-known mathematical property, but it basically means that doing something one time and then applying the same transformation multiple times has the same effect. So it's basically the effect only happens the first time you apply that transformation. Successive tra applications of that transformation have no effect. So if I receive one message, cool. If I receive two messages, also cool, because the second message doesn't do anything. So this is interesting, because if I have these two properties of being commutative and idempotent, which are mathematical prop properties that are analyzable, and that's cool, uh, and I also send messages often enough, then I've overcome all three components at the bottom of this very simple hierarchy. If I've done all of these at the bottom of the hierarchy, I've overcome the entire concept here, which means that I have overcome all possible problems in distributed systems. This is the holy grail of distributed systems. I have, if I can prove that the receiving end has these properties, and I can prove that the sending end over sends often enough to overcome packet loss, which is a bit nebulous, but let's just, let's just say that it is often enough, enough to overcome all possible kinds of packet loss. Great. This is the holy grail. I have solved distributed systems. The problem is that if you, need, if you have these two properties, you lose one you lose one very important th thing that you, you often want. So let's look at what that thing is. Um, well, it, in the general sense, it removes the possibility for, say, a counting system to count downwards. You cannot create a up-down counter like a simple distributed system that just counts upwards and downwards with a system that, where the receivers are both commutative and idempotent. It is actually just not possible. Which means that we now have a system that can only go upwards, which, which is the infinite state machine that only counts upwards, which, well, it's something. Um, We've removed, completely removed, self-referential negation in this feedback loop. And this is the big brain moment. So in order to enforce consistency in a message passing system with loss duplication and reordering, we have removed the opportunity to utter paradoxes across both across the system and internally in the system. But we have no self-referential negation here. So this must always go upwards. This must always count in one direction. And that's like, oh boy, that's, that's some 200 IQ shit, and I'm not sure if I understand it either. So that's cool. The problem is that this is kind of a big limitation. Well, it can solve most problems, I think it technically can solve all polynomial time problems. So you generally want to stay underneath polynomial time in your, in your algorithms. Exponential time algorithms are uh, is a rough life. But uh, it solves these kinds of problems. Uh, the upward counting problems, the latest update problems, and also the, I don't care about consistency right now as long as it ends up being consistent at some point in the future. So the, well, in the elevator system, I don't care if I serve all orders right now as long as I serve all orders eventually, as long as eventually is within the next five minutes, it's fine. So for those kinds of systems, great, it can solve these things. And just by applying two mathematical properties to your Receiver, you too can get a 50% discount on your next toothbrush. Problem is that sometimes that's too restrictive. So let's lift this restriction a bit, see what happens. We've had two extremes so far. On one end, we have to 
we allow all possible reordering. So we need to look at all the permutations and look very closely and see that this works out. And on the other one, we try to collapse all possible permutations into only one. All possible permutations of loss duplication reordering are fine because we've collapsed the entire state space into one space because we have these properties of uh, commutativity and item potency. So both of these are not super great. So let's see if we can allow for some amount of, well, we use the commutative and idempotent properties, great, but we allow for some cases where it's not commutative and some cases where it's not idempotent. And see if we can just analyze the small amount. So we have a huge space, we collapse most of it, and then we analyze this small part of it. That's, this seems like a good methodical approach for the general purpose distributed system. Let's see if it's possible. Spoilers, no. Usually we only need, we can count and keep, do this upward counting system and then we have very small amounts of backwards counting in our system. So new order, unconfirmed, confirmed, completed, back to new order. So it's counting upwards for most of the time and then it resets back down to the bottom. So some amount of unconfirmed, some more confirmed, it's finally completely confirmed, we execute it, we complete it, back to the start again. So five steps upward, one step down, or three steps upward, one step down. So we only need this very specific targeted reverse operation. Things like reset to the initial state or go back to some kind of idle state. So this is, this is convenient. As long as we have the commutative and idempotent property for the upwards counting, we can analyze just the downwards portion, and as long as that part is fine, we're good. The problem here is that sometimes uh, this reset is caused by external factors. And that external factors is things like node crashing. And that's not super cool. Because if a node crashes, well, that can happen at any time. And we wanted it to happen at a very particular time so that we could analyze the outcome. If it can happen at any time, now we need to do analyze the entire sequence of events. And we need to analyze what happens if we crash before we send this message, after we send this message, before we send the next message, and after we send the next message, and so on for all the possible messages and all possible permutations. So we're kind of back to where we started, which um, well, it's better than having to analyze all possible crashing patterns and all possible message permutation patterns because we only need to analyze one of these two now. So we don't have a combinatorial explosion. We just have a large combinatorial space of two nodes crashing, two nodes communicating, and two nodes crashing in whatever order they would crash in. So it's still better. Not perfect system, but it's okay. So... Uh, final conclusion time. Well, we have these two properties. They were nice. Let's see if we can use them as much as possible. We can only use these tools to some extent, and that extent is nodes crashing. Once nodes start crashing as well, usually you end up being kind of more fucked than usual. And finally, there is no, there is no holy grail. It's all application or specification dependent, which means that you need to read, well, you need to understand the application domain well enough to figure out exactly how much consistency you need and how much you can get away with not having. Uh, but really, the fundamental conclusion is really just this. There is no way around this. So, uh, unlucky. That was my part for today. So uh, for the uh, elevator project, well, we're trying to implement some, well, we're not implementing a general purpose distributed system. That's the clue. It, uh, we don't need to figure out exactly how do we solve all possible distributed systems once and for all for all time, because the answer is you can't. It's not possible. So what you need to do if you haven't gotten that far on the order distribution process so far, is read the specification carefully enough to where you find loopholes that allow 
some amount of inconsistencies and then exploit the available inconsistencies as much as possible because that's what lets you implement in order to have maximum consistency you need to implement a lot of protocol protocol is code that you need to write in order to write less code less protocol you need to figure out what inconsistencies that you can get away with which means you need to understand the application and the specification for the application well enough to find out what those permissible inconsistencies are so that's the that's the hint for the distributed system part of the project so any questions to this or the project or anything else Student engagement, by the way. Okay. Yes. Uh, could you give some examples of what modules you could use in the project? For example, yeah. Examples for modules for what specifically? Just like how would I modularize the general yeah, like project? Yes, I can. <laughs> I can give you an example for that, but the thing is, if I give you too many examples, everybody just follows my example, and there's not a whole lot of creativity. But I will say this, though, um, and I wrote this in the exercise five text as well, so if you've read that, it's not exactly, you've seen this before. But you can kind of divide this project into two parts. The first part is we have a set of orders, set of requests, button presses, that we need to distribute. And then the second part is we have distributed these button requests or elevator movement, well, requests, button presses. We have distributed them. Now we need to execute them. So that gives us a nice module divide. It's distribute, execute. Well, the thing that executes is the thing that you're going to write on in exercise five or as a part of exercise five. And then the distribution part, well, it needs to interact with some network player, of course. So really you can kind of get away with just having this is the thing that distributes orders this is the thing that execute orders this is the low-level driver interface to the elevator and this is the this is the um, uh, network module and then you have four modules but what you'll end up seeing is that there, the code that distributes orders well this thing needs to know what the orders are and the thing that executes orders this thing also needs to know what the orders are Okay, they share some amount of data. Is now is this is it okay that you just share this data, or is the data sharing? Does that mean that there is some third module involved here, which is the states of the elevators? So there might be three there, but it's like modularis yeah, modularization happens often as a result of doing the programming. In my experience, like you can design a lot from the start. And the way I, I'm going to cover a bit more about exactly how you do that uh, next time when we talk about testability and how you use this framework for internally in one program. Because what your modules really are are just these kinds of processes. If you're writing in, I don't know what language you're choosing. Uh, Go. Go, yeah, OK. So especially in Go, your modules really are a process is the module. And then it has a bunch of helper functions, which are these ones. And these helper functions can be shared uh, between modules, really. They're just free functions. So the thing that you need to know, well, the, the thing that divides modules then is effectively this piece, the state. Because in order to create a process, the process needs to have state in order to be useful. So what you do is you look through your entire program, the inputs and outputs, and you figure out what exactly is the data what data do I need? What are just draw up the tables for what your data is? Tables are usually way more informative than flowcharts and so on. So focus on figuring out what the what is the data that we need. That's step one, and then step two is figuring out what kind of functions do we need in order to transform that data. And I see a lot of people start on the function end, like okay, the thing needs to do this. Well, based on what information can you do this? If you figure out what the information is first, then the functions kind of fall into place. But if you focus on the functions first, you'll end up that the information, you need a bunch of information from a diff bunch of different sources, and now suddenly you have 10 global variables and oh fuck. So focus on the data first, 
and then the functions. I think that will help you with your modular modularization um, problem. Yeah. Anything else? No. Well then, uh, then we're done here today.